Hey, what do you say? Ready to get started? Welcome to today's Postgres World webinar, building Gen AI applications with PostgreSQL and Google Cloud's Alloy DB Omni. We're joined by Randall Ray, Solutions Manager for Databases Google Cloud, who will discuss how to use Alloy DB Omni to migrate legacy databases to any location, to optimize your PostgreSQL deployments for performance and cost, to get insights on your operational data without copying it to a data warehouse, and how to build generative AI apps based on high-performance PG vector compatible search with full access on your AI models. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers. I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I think that's all from me. Um, and I'm going to hand it off now. So you can take it away, Randall. All right. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Well, welcome, <clears throat> excuse me, welcome everyone uh, to this seminar. It's great to be here in Postgres world. Uh, so I'm Randall Ray. I've been with Google Cloud for about seven years uh, as a customer engineer and also in solutions focusing on databases. Uh, before that, I was with Oracle for 12 years. Uh, so lots of, uh, lots of background in databases. It's great to have you with us. And uh, as far as what we're going to cover today, Lindsay just did a good job of that. But a few questions for you. Uh, did you know that Postgres actually makes a good vector database? Uh, it really does. I'm going to be demonstrating this and talking about it. You don't necessarily need to bring in a specialized vector database if you need one. I hold that thought. Uh, your Postgres SQL application can understand languages. Uh, it, as deep understanding of languages for natural language query using vectors and large language models. It can, I'm gonna demonstrate that as well. Speaking of large language models, did you know you can use SQL to build Gen AI applications? You don't have to be a data scientist, you can use your existing Postgres skills and through SQL uh, generate actually very sophisticated uh, Gen AI applications like chatbots and uh, document, and, uh, applications that generate images and videos and documents. I'll show that as well. Uh, Google makes on-premise Postgres compatible database software. A lot of people weren't aware of that, but we do. That will be demonstrated today as well. Postgres can run really well on Kubernetes with high availability failover and health monitoring. Yes, it can, we'll talk about that. And some of the frustrations that we might have with Postgres and I've had with Postgres in my career Scalability, performance, trying to do real-time analytics on operational data, issues with vacuuming, having to tune storage. A lot of those problems are actually fairly easy to solve. And we'll be talking about that as well. So if any of these are of interest to you, stay tuned. Uh, first, uh, I don't think I have to uh, preach to the choir here. I would imagine that you are already sold on Postgres, but what we found, so this is a survey from Stack Overflow last year, is that more developers use Postgres than anything else. 49% uh, of developers use Postgres. Uh, it's interesting, but in the past few years, MySQL and Postgres have kind of swapped places. So Postgres is more popular than MySQL now. And you'll notice also that a couple of things, Oracle is way down here in eighth place or whatever it is. Now this is not revenue, this is number of developers, but one of the things I saw seven years ago when I decided to go from Oracle to, to Google is I didn't see a lot of new applications on Oracle. It's a great product, but not a lot of new applications. And quite a few of these databases are actually Google. So BigQuery, Firebase, uh, what else? Um, you know, Cloud Firestore. So yeah, Postgres is, is king now. And you're gonna see that Google is very much focused on Postgres. All right, so, but Postgres isn't perfect. And having used it a lot as we all have, there are some issues that we typically have with it. So here's what I've been doing for much of my career and particularly the past few years. I've been getting people off of Oracle, off of SQL Server and onto Postgres. And I've migrated many customers, migrated the code. There are great tools for doing that. We'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. Migrated the data, they're great tools for that, both third parties as well as from Google. And so I practice what I preach. I'm getting customers off of those really expensive high license fee platforms and going on to Postgres. But there are some issues that we typically run into. So these are the issues that we wanted to solve 
so we could really have the big commercial grade applications running on Postgres. First over on the left, scaling issues for transaction processing workloads, scaling up to maybe 16 V CPUs, it kind of tails off after that. Your mileage may vary, you might get better scaling than that, but can we really, really scale to more like 64 or 128 V CPUs? Because that's what customers are running Oracle on. Difficult to administer and manage, uh, as are all databases. I don't know if Postgres is particularly difficult, but can we make it easier? Storage man management, not having to shard the data, issues with vacuuming and you know, transaction ID exhausted, replication lag. Can there be better administration tools available? Uh, Oracle's got some great tools for that. Oh, my query is running slow. You go into Enterprise Manager and click on, there it is. Can we have something like that in Postgres as well? And then another thing is the demands of our databases are getting stricter and stricter. We are having our users come to us more and more often to get our data. Uh, so the databases are getting overloaded. And, and also with generative AI and with AI and machine learning, it's our data that's being used to train the models as well as to do inferences in machine learning applications. So there's more and more demand of our data we are expected to deliver that data in real time, not copying it to a data warehouse necessarily and taking two days to do that, but delivering real-time analytics from operational data. So these are three problems that Google has been dedicated to solve. And we brought in people from Oracle like me, uh, people from uh, Microsoft and from database companies all over the world to come into Google and use Google's innovative technology and in our infrastructure to solve these problems. Speaking of generative AI, it's of course a very important topic in the industry today. I'm gonna to try to be practical here though. Uh, I'm not gonna hype Gen AI too much. I think there's been a lot of that done already, but I'm gonna show you what I actually use Gen AI for practically. And I'm gonna show you exactly how with SQL statements, you can put it in your uh, Postgres applications. So one of the other challenges that we have is with Gen AI for training the models as well as doing inferences, we need accurate data. We need enterprise grade performance that's secure and highly available. Security and privacy is becoming more and more important. Regulatory issues, data sovereignty requirements are getting stricter, not, not looser. Oh, uh, we're a German bank. You want us as a customer? The data has to be in Germany. If you don't have a data center in Germany, well, too bad, right? So th this problem is getting worse. So where is enterprise grade, accurate, secure, and highly available data? It's in the database. That's why increasingly gener generative AI applications are going to be demanding data from our databases. And that's why we're talking about this today. Here's another problem. Uh, how many data scientists are there? Answer, not very many. I am not a data scientist, but you're gonna see demos and applications that I built that use generative AI. Now, if you are a data scientist, great. Google's got great tools for that, but there are over 10 times more software developers compared to data science. So the only skills you need to do the things I'm gonna talk about in, in this presentation are Postgres skills, SQL skills, that's it. If you are a data scientist, great, but you don't have to be to use this stuff. All right, so I don't wanna to have too big a commercial for Google Cloud. The reason why I show this slide is because there's some confusion. Uh, Google Cloud actually offers five, count them, five ways of running Postgres. Uh, we're very, very dedicated to it. But in some cases, customers think, well, maybe that's too many choices. So really briefly, I'm just gonna go over what each of these offerings are and what your choices are. Uh, first offering, if you wanna run open source Postgres, in Google Cloud, in our Compute Engine, with the Compute Engine Virtual Machine, like you would in another cloud, or our, our GCVE, that's our VMware engine, or you run it in Kubernetes, you can do that. You can do that today, open source Postgres, but you would have to manage it. So you're responsible for tuning the database, managing it, high availability, backups, recovery, that kind of thing. But you can do that right now, and you've always been able to do that. So that's option number one. Second is our Cloud SQL Managed Service. That has been around for a long time. It's a great product. That is open source Postgres. That's the same open source software that you would run on-premise. 
in a managed service. So we do the backups. We have some very advanced monitoring and query insights tools that are part of Cloud SQL. High availability and disaster recovery, that's, in, that's part of Cloud SQL as well. Plus, if you want to run MySQL and SQL Server, that's available in Cloud SQL as well. So that's a good product. Spanner, I want to mention it, not going to spend too much time on it today, but that is a big, scalable, worldwide database. Uh, when I was at Oracle, we often got asked about, well, can I have a global database? Can I have a database in Australia? In other words, North America, and it looks like one big database. So that's what Spanner does. You double the number of servers and the, your transaction throughput doubles. There is a Postgres interface, a Postgres API. It is not 100% Postgres compatible. Spanner is kind of a different database. Obviously, if you're going to Australia to get data, the whole concept of latency is a little bit different. You need to think about that in your application design. But it is, uh, it is an offering. We've just added that Postgres SQL interface. Next, we come to AlloyDB. That is our commercial grade Postgres offering. It's only Postgres, that's the only engine. And again, the marketplace has spoken very loudly, Postgres is king. So it's only for Postgres. It uses Google's infrastructure, including our Colossus storage, the very same storage that's used for YouTube. So you post a YouTube video, you have to be a database administrator if suddenly a million people watch your video. No, the underlying storage shards itself, replicates itself throughout the world. That storage is what underlies AlloyDB, so it's, and it is fully Postgres compatible. If you have a Postgres application, it will run on that AlloyDB managed service. And then finally, we have AlloyDB Omni, and that is the uh, product I'm going to be talking about most, although the demos I'm going to show will work both with AlloyDB, the cloud managed service, as well as with that AlloyDB Omni. So what is AlloyDB Omni? It is on-prem software. It is shipped as a container. There is a one command installation uh, and it just runs and it is also fully Postgres compatible. Why are we doing this? Why is Google offering on-premise Postgres software? Uh, the answer is because we had to walk away from a lot of opportunities. Of course, we have Google Cloud over here. You can run AlloyDB or Postgres over in Google Cloud. Well, what about if you have to stay on premise? You just have to, for whatever reason, uh, you want to go multi cloud. And frankly, going multi cloud is a good idea. Yeah, I work for Google, but if you are multi cloud, you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, you have uh, power when you negotiate contracts and pricing because the sales teams know that there's a competitor. And increasingly, customers want to be multi cloud, they want to run on Amazon and Azure and Google, and they, they, wanna, they wanna do the best, you know, whoever's got the best product wins. And so that makes us compete for your business. Next, increasingly sovereign or disconnected applications. Again, you wanna work with a German bank, you gotta run in Germany, or there could be a country where a cloud provider doesn't have a region. Sovereign and disconnected has become increasingly an issue because there are more and more laws that require it. And then what about on the edge? You're in a little tiny telecom, facility underneath the cell phone tower, you're on a cruise ship where you're not connected to the internet very well when you're at sea. What about that? So these last four, on-prem, multi-cloud, sovereign, and edge, we had to walk away from this. We now have strong offerings. We have AlloyDB Omni as on-prem Postgres software. We also can build a cloud data center on-premise, and we can run an AlloyDB Omni managed service, a Postgres managed service, on-prem that looks just like Google Cloud. I won't do, dwell too much longer on a commercial for Google, but I just want, want you to be aware that increasingly Google Cloud is going on-premise. So what is AlloyDB Omni? It looks and acts like Postgres. If, you're, if you have a Postgres application, it runs. It uses Postgres tools and APIs. That's what I'm gonna be showing today. It's shipped as a container. So install Docker or Kubernetes or whatever your favorite container management system is. It downloads with one command, installs and configures itself, and you're ready to go. Developer versions are free. You can download it right now. You can play with it as much as you want, do as much development as you want on it. There is a subscription fee for production. What is that? We do have public pricing available uh, in our public internet sites or, or public websites. 
I am not going to give you a price quote. It could be your Google Cloud customer. You might have a discount. It's also going to depend on the number of eCPUs, but there is a subscription fee for production, but you can feel free to download it as much as you want, do development on as much as you want, and that is free. There's also, by the way, there's no phone home. There's no license key. Just download it. It installs. It runs. It works. Here's a quote from uh, Neuropace. LEDV AI and LEDV Omni's indexing and embedded query capabilities streamline medical analysis, eliminating the need for external processing among millions of patient records. Uh, interesting. You mean you can put documents in Postgres and have very, very fast uh, analysis of those documents? And the answer is yes. And that's one of the things I'm going to be demonstrating. So let's talk about performance a little bit. First thing, first and foremost reason why LEDV Omni is so fast is the columnar engine. Uh, this is pretty cool. I'm going to demonstrate in just a moment. But here's what we do. It's Postgres compatible. You have these normal Postgres row store. You create tables in Postgres just like you do in Postgres today. But if you enable the columnar engine, then behind the scenes, we are going to put columns in memory in columnar format. It's done automatically. You can also do it manually. If you want to say there's, these are columns I'm going to do analytics on, issue a command, and they will go up into memory. Well, with that columnar engine, the performance improvements are extraordinary. Well, let me actually demonstrate that. How about that? Let me actually show you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use PG Admin, and just which also demonstrates that um, you can use PG Admin. Uh, this so the the demo, by the way, is running on my laptop. It's which is right back there. It's actually running on a little USB stick in a Debian virtual machine on that Windows laptop back there. So this is not any huge hardware. It's running on a laptop in Debian. This is PG Admin. As you can see, you can use it to monitor LEDB Omni or whatever tools you use for Postgres today. You can use those with LEDB Omni as well. So first thing, I'm going to give a scenario. This is not data I made up. This is a PPCH, uh, Transaction Processing Console H benchmark, standard benchmark in the industry. It's from the 90s, the good old decade. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's a, it's a data warehouse benchmark database. There are hundreds of millions of rows. The scenario that I'm going to play out here is you want real-time analytics on operational data. It's Black Friday. You have a retail system. Hundreds of transactions are coming in every minute or even thousands. People are shopping on Black Friday. You give the customer a discount. Let's say you give them a coupon at 10 o'clock in the morning. At 1030, I want to know right now, are customers using the coupon? And are we increasing our revenue? Then I'd like to know some more information about margins, and I want to find out right now. Not tomorrow, not loading the data to a data warehouse, but real-time analytics on real-time data so I can make instant decisions because in retailing, margins are razor thin. So I ran this query. The scenario is I increased the discount from 1% to 2%. On Black Friday weekend, November 26th through November 28th, I want to find out what my revenue was. I ran the query. It took, uh, what was it, two minutes and six seconds? Pretty good for scanning hundreds of millions of rows. These columns do not have indexes. Can't put an index on everything. It slows down, inserts, updates, and deletes too much. And what I found out was, well, but yeah, with the 2% discount, I actually got higher revenue than I did with 1%. So that was good. But it took two minutes. It also really chewed up the CPU and really limited the performance of my Postgres instance, which is why typically this is not done with heavily used production to Postgres instances. I typically don't do analytics on them because it just slows things down. All right, I'm now gonna use our columnar engine. So remember the, that query ran in two minutes. This command here is optional. Uh, the, the optimizer, if it sees that the data is in columnar format, it will just use it, but I'll go ahead and run it. Okay, so the previous query took two minutes. It's exactly the same query. Let's see what happens now. Boom, 94 milliseconds. Uh, the demo guy must be cheating. That can't possibly be right. Let me do it again. Uh, click 87 milliseconds. Okay, this is not cheating. It's actually computer science. All right, what's going on here? The data is in columnar format in memory. In addition to being able to scan in memory, is, right, you have the Postgres buffer cache. 
but scanning individual memory pages is actually kind of a slow operation. In addition to it being in columnar format in memory, there's also metadata inside the columnar engine. So it knows only to scan that date range. It doesn't have to scan the all 200 million rows. The other thing is we can actually use a different instruction set on the CPU called SIMD, or um, uh, what is that? Uh, it, it, it's a multi-instruction set that is on the CPU. Uh, so uh, different instruction set on the CPU and metadata, and it's in memory. That's why it is so fast. So this is actually considerably more than 100 times faster. So with this capability, I can do all sorts of analytics that are very complex and have it come back very, very quickly without chewing up the system, without chewing up the CPU or storage. I can show you uh, the columns that are actually in memory right now. So you notice the shift date. Uh, there's, a, there's a view called G columnar columns, the shift date, the order key, the discount. The system automatically put those columns in memory because it automatically analyzed your workloads, analyzed the queries, and put the columns in memory that were necessary. So uh, yeah, columnar engine, one of the biggest reasons why AlloyDB can give you that real-time insight into your data uh, and do it very, very quickly. All right, I switch back to my presentation. So the elements of a better open source database, for, so for Google, it's Postgres, fully Postgres compatible, with Google innovation and nobody's been doing more uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning than Google has over many, many years. In terms of performance, in addition to the very fast columnar engine for analytics that I just showed, we've run various benchmarks and this is actually a third party that ran this. It's a PPC again, standard benchmark PPCC uh, with 16 B CPUs with same storage, same, you know, same number of CPUs, same CPU speed. We got about double the throughput. With 32 B CPUs, you can see that Alloy DB Omni scales better as you increase the number of, of B CPUs. So your transaction performance, your basic inserts, updates, deletes, selects for OLTP also scales significantly better. And the more, the higher the number of B CPUs you have, the better that it gets. Uh, why does that happen? Well, we've rewritten quite a few of the algorithms and the software that are inside Postgres. So one of the things we do, and this is actually about replication and replication lag. If you have a replica, let's say you have a read-only replica, or you have a replica for high availability, or you do it, you're doing disaster recovery, what we do is we actually do parallel apply on the receiver, on the, on the replica. We also do things like we, we do more um, a prefetching, and we just made the algorithm for reading that wall log, which is also what Postgres replication does, transmitting it and then replaying it much faster. So what we found is on a heavily used system, uh, LEDB Omni actually has significantly less replication lag than you would see with open source Postgres. And we know that's one of the problems that you sometimes run into with Postgres. Okay, well, what about ease of use? Uh, we showed you Alloy, we, we showed you uh, PG Admin. Whatever tools that you use today, However, you are managing your Postgres instance today, you can do that with AlloyDB Omni as well. Uh, we have additional recommendations as well in our documentation, but if you're managing and, and monitoring and administering Postgres today, you can use the same tools with the same techniques. The other thing we have that reduces the burden of the administrator are autopilots. So memory management, I'll show you a slide on that in just a moment, automatic memory management not only of the columnar engine, but also of the buffer cache. An index advisor that will tell you, based on your workload, uh, what your best index strategy is. Adaptive auto vacuum. And then we've talked about already auto columnarization. will automatically put data from your row store into columnar format in memory for very fast analytics. So in terms of automatic memory management, you don't have to statically define the size of the buffer cache with Postgres in LADB Omni will automatically increase or decrease the size of the buffer cache based on your workload, will automatically increase or decrease the size of the memory that's used with columnar en engine based on your workload. You can also turn that off. There are various control knobs that you can use with that, but the ability to do automatic memory management, particularly for a heavily used system, 
It means you typically do get better performance and you have less administrative overhead. You don't have to shut everything down in order to reconfigure memory. So the system's up, it's up and running longer. Automatic vacuum management. Postgres does auto vacuuming as well, but we have done a lot to improve the algorithms for very heavily used systems. Uh, it, you know, for those of you who've done heavily used Postgres databases, you've probably seen that dreaded transaction ID exhaustion error message. Uh, what we do is we assign more resources to vacuuming if it's possible. Uh, we, we are monitoring your workload. We also learn your workload through machine learning. So based on not only your workload right now, but your workload, how it's been in the past and how it accelerates or de decelerates, we'll adjust the vacuuming algorithm uh, accordingly. And we will throttle new transaction IDs to prevent that dreaded transaction ID exhaustion error message. So automatic vacuum management is another way that we make Postgres easier to use. We have an index advisor. It, part of it is it uses the Postgres extension uh, Hypo PG, and part of it is our algorithm. But what we do is, again, we track your workload. What's your workload? Oh, I can see that there's some columns I can put into memory to really improve your analytics. I can see that, well, maybe we wouldn't put this into memory, but if you put an index on it based on the history of your workload, it would make your workload a lot faster. So this index advisor is another way. It's, it's interesting, but having been with databases for decades, as I have, uh, whether it's Oracle or Postgres or whatever the database is, I quite often find databases have indexes that are just simply not necessary. All they're doing is slowing you down, increasing storage. This will tell you what indexes are actually necessary based on your workload. All right, generative AI. That's kind of a hot topic right now. Let's take a look at it. Uh, so there are different databases out there, and some people are using different databases for vector, a like different vector database. They're using a different database for operational online transactions and a different database for generative AI. The good news I have for you is with your Postgres skills, with Postgres SQL, you can do all these things and you can do it very effectively. Uh, the thing about databases is it provides the most up-to-date data which is what everybody wants. Um, one of the complaints people have with generative AI large language models is it's giving you old data. You want it up to date. Where's your up to date data? It's in your database. Uh, you can see, and I'll demonstrate how you can efficiently store and search vector embeddings. And it's, it's got all the security and privacy of the Postgres and of Google. So, this, uh, what I'm going to show you now in, the, in a demonstration is our interface with our Vertex AI product, which runs in Google Cloud. You can also build your own models in another cloud or somewhere else or on-prem. You can interface it with that as well. But just to let you know what Vertex AI is, first thing, and this is what I use in the demo, pre-trained APIs, AI agents, and the Vertex AI model garden. You just call the models. You don't have to train them. You don't have to be a data scientist. You use SQL. Very, very easy to use. I'll show you that in a moment. You, if you want to train models, and you're not a data scientist, and you're not writing a lot of Python code, we have a product called AutoML. It's been around for several years. You can actually use your database data. You can use images, videos, train a model without having to write any code. Uh, so it's a no-code or low-code approach. That's available in Vertex AI. But if you are a data scientist, don't, I'm not bad-mouthing data scientists. We have end-to-end -end AI tools for the full life cycle of machine learning and artificial intelligence to help data scientists and ML engineers build and deploy AI. So you can use our models, you can train your own models without having to write code, or your data scientists can train models as well. And Vertex AI supplies all that. What I'm gonna be showing you now in the demo is the Vertex AI model garden. And there are literally hundreds of models that are available to you, such as our new Gemini 1.5 Pro, I'm going to show you actually an older model, which is called Palm 2 Tex Bison. That was our old BARD model, uh, which is based on Transformer. By the way, chat GPT, the T stands for Transformer. We invented that back in 2018. There are lots of models, not only for text and documents, but also for images, um, just uh, speech, video, multimedia. Hundreds of models are available that you can call directly from SQL in Postgres 
and use those, which is what I'm going to show you right now. You can also manage the model endpoints. You can connect your models to your own environment. They can be in Google Cloud, they can be in other cloud. We have out-of-the-box integration with OpenAI and Vertex AI's text embedding models, so we are vendor agnostic on this, and we automatically generate embeddings for your data. Okay, so let's take a look at this, what I'm talking about here. Let's go back to our demo. Let me switch my screen here. Okay, so uh, I have a open source movie review database that's been used for various projects at Stanford. And I have, I have about 10,000 reviews, movie reviews from old movies, as I'm a, I'm a movie buff. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use our text bison, that's our Palm 2 model. I could be using Gemini 1.5 Pro as well. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to generate a negative review of the 1997 film Titanic. I really like that movie, but can it actually generate a document that's credible that gives a, a negative review of Titanic? This is how I actually do it in SQL. It looks a little weird, right? You got all this JSON stuff, but here's an example. We have examples in our documentation as well. I am going to insert a new movie review into the database. I am going to call this function called mlPredictRow. And I have set up the model endpoint to be our Palm 2 model. It could be your model, it could be in OpenAI, it could be anywhere. Pass it some JSON. The prompt I am giving it is generate a negative review of the 1997 film Titanic. And I'm gonna put it in the database. All right, let's click on that and let's see what happens. And there it is. It's a brand new row in my Postgres uh, movie reviews table. I missed, I, I did the wrong year so I can recognize that it's, it's my record that I just generated. It's actually 97. And let's take a look at the review. Disappointing epic. Titanic is an ambitious film that attempts to tell blah, blah, blah. The film's too long. First half is too slow. And it's kind of a long review, actually. But it did it. Um, let's do it again. How about a negative review of Star Wars? I don't know why I'm so negative, but all I need to do is just change the prompt. I pass the prompt into this and I could do something else. So I'll click on that. And so it goes out to Vertex AI, calls our Palm 2 Bison model, comes back and there it is, uh, negative view of Star Wars. The underwhelming experience, here's where I feel that Star Wars lacked. It did not bring anything new or exciting. I completely disagree with that, but yeah, you can generate documents. You've seen this with generative AI before, but now you can put it directly in Postgres in exactly the SQL statement that I'm showing you here. Okay, let's do something. Uh, I, don't, I don't do that very much though. When I use generative AI in my day-to-day -day job, which I do, I don't generate documents. I mean, some people do. I, I prefer to write them myself. I guess I'm kind of old fashioned in that way. But there are some things that I do and what customers do. One of the things is sentiment analysis. So again, you have a large retailer, People are posting reviews, hundreds of them a day sometimes. I want to find out immediately, is it a positive or negative review? And I want to find out immediately, just give me a couple sentence summary. I don't, I don't want to read the whole thing. Just, just tell me what the person's saying so I can respond proactively and immediately. And what we have here is an update statement in Postgres. And I'm saying, analyze the sentiment, positive or negative, of this movie review. And it's the Titanic review that I just generated in the database. So now let's do a sentiment analysis. Is, was the review positive or negative? It was negative, indeed it was. It's very accurate, actually. It works surprisingly well. When I started playing with this about a year ago, I was actually kind of surprised at how well it works. And the models work better and better as time goes on. And sure enough, the review, that's the review we just generated. So it is indeed a negative review. So with this, I can take a very proactive response within a couple of seconds. I know each review, whether they're positive or negative. Here's what I really use generative AI for a lot in my day-to-day -day work, summaries. So one of the things I do is I do a lot of interviews for candidates, like engineering candidates that wanna work for Google. And what I do is I do the interview. You have to take a, you know, I do a manually typed transcript but then in our system that tracks it, I need to summarize those interviews, and that can be quite a laborious and time-consuming task. In this particular example, I have found negative reviews of my retail 
firm. All right, well, give me a summary in two sentences what the review says. And again, this model does very well. I'm going to update the table in the database for my Titanic review that I just generated. I will click on that. Here it comes. And here's the summary. It is in two sentences. Uh, Titanic is overly long, melodramatic, and predictable. A film that fails to live up to its epic ambitions. Despite its impressive visuals and exciting com climax, the film's excessive length, one-dimensional characters, unconvincing romance, hinder its overall effectiveness. That is actually a very, very good summary of that review. And if the review was written by a person, it's also, um, it also is really quite accurate. So that's how you do it. And this is an example of documents and text. This is, for example, how that medical company we talked about earlier uses it. You could have a very, very large Postgres database with lots of documents and, and be very, very effective, not only with our models in Google Vertex AI, with models that you train and also models that are in other clouds. All right, I'll switch back to my presentation. I do have one more demo to show you. All right, so next topic, vector database. Yeah, Postgres can actually be a very good vector database. We use the PG vector open source extension. Uh, what's a vector? I want to tell you what that is in case you don't know. I didn't know until about a year ago. What a vector is, it is an array. It's an array of numbers or, or array, array of whatever, uh, multidimensional. Uh, however, with a vector, unlike an array, a vector has the concept of distance. So it, for example, knows that a cat and a dog are similar. And if you were to, for example, do a, a, a vector embedding search and you compare cat, dog, and cockroach, Cockroach will be judged being a further distance away from cat and dog. So it's got the concept of distance, which means it also has the concept of similarity. So what we do is we, with LEDB and LEDB Omni, with PG Vector, is we have the models that are in Vertex AI, or they could be in another cloud. Those models turn your text, your images, your videos into numbers into vectors where then similarity or dis, you know, similar distance searches can be done. And we put indexes on those vectors so you have very, uh, very fast searches. So the embedding models both uh, turn the data into numbers, into vectors, and do the search on those numbers for similarity. Okay, let me show you exactly how that works with real SQL statements. I will switch back to my demo. And so let's let's do this. Uh, so here's here's what's going to happen here now. Notice it's an update statement. What I'm going to do is I am going to turn the actual review. So remember in Titanic we had that long review that was a really negative review. I'm going to turn that into vectors, in, in, into numbers. I'm going to use our uh, model, which is called Text Embedding Gecko. Uh, there's a white paper out there on Gecko. It's a, it's a very popular model for doing this. In this particular case, I'm also uh, going to give it a, a version number. Okay? And I'll hold that thought for a moment. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But first, I'm going to show you this. So we're going to turn the review into a vector of numbers, a multidimensional array, and then we're going to take a look at it. So let's take a look at it. In fact, what I'm going to what I'm actually going to show you is um, the uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you all the uh, all the reviews that have the word Titanic in it, and it's taking a little bit of time for some reason. We'll see what happens. There it goes, uh, and I'm I'm processing a lot of the rows that are in the database, which is why it took a while. Okay, so that you can see all the reviews of Titanic. There are quite a few of them in my movie database. So there's the review, right? And here is the vector, which is it's an array of numbers, right? But this text and back and get a model can not only be used to generate the vectors, but can also be used to do a natural language search. One thing that I am just going to advise you on, and just in my experience in building these applications, uh, I am doing the version number specifically so I get the same results in each demo. I want my demo to work. But you want to be a little bit careful with that um, because the models do have a shelf life. We do deprecate models. 
We have a list in Vertex AI of all of our model guard models and how long they're going to be supported. It, generative AI is moving very, very fast. Um, if you put a version number in your application, although it may have the same results each time, it could be that you may run into a de deprecation problem even in just a few months. So I just want you to be aware of that. In a generative AI application, it's probably going to be an application, at least for the next couple of years, that will need some maintenance. You'll need maybe to change the, the model number or change the name of the model because it's things are moving very, very fast in, in generative AI. Okay, well, I've got my vectors in the database. Now I'm going to show you what is kind of a typical text query in Postgres. I know there are quite a few ways of doing text searches in Postgres. Uh, I'm doing a typical like query. So what I'm going to search for in my movie database is give me uh, a review that's about a ship, that's a disaster movie, that's historical. And I'm just going to do a like query. And I'm going to click and see what kind of results I get. The results are pretty bad. Um, so let's see. Well, Airport 77 is a disaster movie. It's about an airplane, not a ship. The Searchers is not a disaster film. Prayer for the Dying is not a disaster film. The, the word ship and the word disaster and the word historical had to appear together in that order. Um, that's, that's not what I want to do. Um, is there a better way to do it? And yes, it's with the vectorized natural language query. So I'm going to do this time, I'm going to use the text embedding gecko model, uh, text embedding gecko model to query the vectors and do a proximity search, uh, to show me the rows that are the, the, the closest in that vector search. And I'm going to do natural language. Give me a disaster film about a ship that is historical. Okay, so let's compare the previous query to how vectorized searches with text and and gecko does. And we'll click on that. Let's see what happens here. Ah, much better results. So yes, Titanic, including that's the review that I just generated. That is a disaster film about a ship that's historical. So is A Night to Remember. A Night to Remember was also about Titanic. It's a very good film, by the way. Uh, it's from 1958. Much better results, natural language query. Lots of customers are using this, for example, in product searches. So a grandmother wants to buy a superhero bath toy for her three-year-old nephew. You just, she just puts in the chat bot, I want to buy a, uh, my, for my three-year-old nephew, I want to buy a superhero bath toy. And the system has a product uh, catalog with descriptions. It knows that Spider-Man and Superman are superheroes. It knows that there's a toddler, so it's, it's, it's for a young child. Maybe it's like a little doll or something that's going to be safe. So this is a really, really powerful way to do natural language queries. And it's one of many things that vectors can actually do. All right, just have a couple more topics before we open it up to Q&A, which I'll kind of go through quickly. Uh, a couple of things. One is there's, there's a lot more advanced capability that I haven't shown you. Uh, let's say you, you have a large language model, you're doing generative AI, and somebody asks, well, what's my company's paid time off policy? You, you send that into Gemini, you send that into ChatGPT, it, it can't answer, it's too specific, it doesn't know about your company. So that's where retrieval augmented generation or RAG, R-A-G, comes in. It makes your queries like that a lot more accurate. The way it works is there's a natural language search like we just saw in the previous demo. Uh, it goes to the database and does a vector search with natural language, pulls those results and sends it into a large language model, which gives much better prompts than you would normally have for a large language model. And then the results come back from the LLM that are much more accurate and much more applicable to your, to your AI application than there would be otherwise. So RAG or uh, retrieval augmented generation is a very powerful feature. Also very DevOps friendly. One command installs LEDB Omni. That's the command there. You can download it right now. Uh, the new one command, by the way, just went general availability yesterday. So you can go to the documentation, you can download the container right now and try it. Uh, you can deploy LEDB Omni standalone. That's what I did on my VM and my laptop right back there. You can deploy it on VMware. You can deploy it on a, a cloud compute engine. 
and you can deploy it on Kubernetes. With Kubernetes, we also supply a Kubernetes operator, which does provisioning, backups, and high availability, among with general health checking and monitoring and all the good things that Kubernetes provides. So for example, if you want high availability, you run LED beyond me in Kubernetes, and this is what our on-prem managed service is going to do. Uh, you have your primary node, it's replicating to a replica. There's a health probe that it's monitoring the health of the database. If your primary goes down or you shut it down for maintenance, then there's an automatic failover. The uh, replica becomes the primary and it automatically fires up a, another replica. So you can fail back. There's also automatic configuration. There are a lot of things that Kubernetes does for you. And so in addition to LADB Omni, we also have the LADB Omni Kubernetes operator. And one last thing I would like to talk about before we go into uh, Q&A, uh, we can help you migrate. So what do I do next? Um, like I say, I've been very focused on getting people off of Oracle or SQL Server, or you might be on another database, or you might be on on-premise Postgres or another cloud provider. Uh, we, can get you, we can get you migrated. There are lots of tools available, in a way kind of too many. Um, so how would we, would we even know that, and how would Google Cloud help you with that journey? Let's say it's an Oracle database. Well, how big is it? Uh, how big an instance of LADB Omni or LADB am I gonna need to run to accommodate it? Uh, that's a really complicated question. The other thing is, I've got all those stored procedures in my database and the stored procedure language in Postgres is different, it's a different language. What's it gonna cost me to convert all that code and is there a tool for me to do that? Well, one of the things we can help you with and you reach out to Google Cloud Sales for this, is what we call our DMA, or Free Database Migration Assessment. There's an open source collector that's on GitHub. You download it, you create a user in your database that just looks at, in, in Oracle, it's the Active Workload Repository, or AWR. It just looks at performance data, and it comes up with um, everything that you need to know. How difficult is it going to be to migrate? What's the sizing of my, of my, my Postgres system is going to be? Uh, we give you recommendation on what tools to use. Uh, we've got our own tool, which is called Database Migration Service. Sometimes with some databases like SQL Server, we might recommend a third-party tool like Stream and provide you with licenses at no charge during the migration. We can also, in some cases, provide funding for your migration. And if you plan on migrating to one of our cloud databases, like LADB Omni or LADB, Cloud SQL Spanner, Big Table, uh, we can provide partner service funds so we can help pay for a partner to do the migration. We can also provide our own professional services, our own PSO, to help you with the migration. We can pay for that. Or cloud credits. So our what we call our gold program, uh, funding for your migration, that is also available. So that would be the next step, is to do that assessment first, get an idea of what the scope of, the, of your migration project is, and then we can help you decide what tools to use. We have strategies, we've done this a lot, we can give you best practices, and we're very, very happy to do that, and again, at no charge. So we've got a way to get you from where you are to uh, where you would like to be. All right, and with that, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining, and I would like to open it up to questions now, and I think, uh, let's see, is that I'm in the chat back. room? Yeah. Okay, so the first question we got was, is it able to load hundreds of millions of rows into an in-memory columnar store on a laptop? Uh, so it, it is, uh, and, it, and it did in my case. So uh, how does it fit in memory? Well, my laptop has 64 gig of RAM, so I will, I will admit that, although I'm only using 32 gig for the Debian VM, which actually runs an Oracle VirtualBox. Um, yes, yeah, so first it's just columns, it's not the entire row. So only the columns that are necessary are actually loaded into RAM. Second thing, there's very high compression. So columnar format itself is actually very, very compressible. So rather than storing multiple values of, of duplicate data, like a row store would do, we'll actually store tokens. Uh, so compressibility is anywhere from around 3x to 10x, and it, Again, your mileage may vary. 
Varkar's character-based data can be compressed more than the numbers can, but yeah, you can. There's very heavy compression and you know, I demonstrated that. And we can, by the way, there's an advisor in LADB and LADB Omni that can tell you how much memory it's gonna take based on the, the columns. And in that query I did in the demo where it showed you the list of columns that were in memory, it showed you how much memory it was actually consuming and how much memory was actually left. So we have tools to monitor that. Great, thank you. Um, and we have one more question. How does this Kubernetes operator handle engine upgrade? Or in general, how are major version upgrades handled on AlloyDB? Yeah, so we are working on that uh, today. Uh, what you have to do is you've got to dump the database. Uh, it, so, so we're so we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the tough question first, which is major version upgrade. I'm going from 14 to 15 or 15 to 16. So you use any Postgres tool that you want, PG dump or whatever whatever compatible backup utility that you like using. You dump that, you do uh, shut down the database, you restore it, and then you switch over. Uh, Kubernetes can be set up to do that. It does involve an outage day. We are working on though, doing major version upgrades without outages. We don't have that today. Now your question about minor version upgrades, that's a completely different story. AlloyDB, or managed service, does minor upgrades, security patches without any downtime. What we do behind the scenes is fire up a, a new virtual machine. It's transparent to the user. Uh, we start replicating data to the new virtual machine that has the new version of the software with the patches. We switch over. There is maybe a pause of a few seconds, if even that. There's no, there's no outage. There's no outage to the user. So minor version upgrades we do automatically behind the scenes. Wonderful. And the last question we've received is, does AlloyDB support logical replication? Yes, so it, it does. We support um, Walt JSON. We support PG Logical as extensions. If you want to do your own replication, you're welcome to with the same tools that you use for Postgres today. We use versions of that for our own replication when, if you want a high availability replica or you want a disaster recovery replica in another region. But yes, absolutely it does. Both AlloyDB Omni and, and AlloyDB support that. Okay, wonderful. I think those are the questions. We All right, have. excellent. Yeah, so first of all, thank you. This was awesome. Um, I really appreciate it. And also the presentation plus the demo, loved that. Yeah, and I, you know, I, you know, this is stuff I actually do myself. I wrote this code. Um, this is a, you know, I, this was my demo. I wrote it. I do this on a daily basis. So I just wanted to make it practical. There's a lot of hype with generative AI. I want to show you how, how I use it and how you, the actual code that you'd use to put it in a Postgres application. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Of course. And it, and that was that was clear that this is a useful version of it. Um, I also want to thank everyone who joined today. Um, thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. Um, so regardless of where you are, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I will see you on future Postgres World webinars. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.